Well, I mean, I cover everything, but you know, I'm a like you, you, you want to cover like areas that you feel like are not getting covered enough. Um, but I, I, I try and spread it around, but yeah. So born and raised in San Antonio, born and raised on the West side, 78207. If you, uh, if you know me, that's like, I rep that zip code really hard. Um, it's where I grew up. It's, um, one of the most economically disadvantaged zip codes in the States. Um, and it's, uh, it's molded me to the person you see today, but yeah. So I got into journalism. Um, I like to tell the story. It's a quick, funny story. My uncle, you know, who was wealthy at the time, um, I was living with him temporarily when my mother was sick. He asked me one day when I was 13, what do you want to do with your life? And I'm like, oh, I'm 13. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. So we came to the conclusion. He's like, hey, combine your passion for writing. If you love sports, be a journalist. And I'm like, what the hell is a journalist? Because I'm this poor kid from the West. I don't know what a journalist is. He's like, it's a reporter. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Um, you know, I don't act on that um, until I'm 15 after my mother passed away. Um, it was like a couple months afterwards and landed at this um, great journalism program in high school. And um, my senior year, I hear about this thing called UJW, the Urban Journalism Workshop, and essentially two weeks. And we, you were high schoolers and we write about stories you won't typically write. So in my resume, they knew this kid loves sports. He loves sports. So we're not going to give them that story, <laughs> which I was so angry. Like there was a girl who knew nothing about sports and she got the story and I got a story that she would be an expert. And it was so funny. They did that on purpose, obviously. And I ended up covering human trafficking, which is a heavy issue for anyone to cover, let alone an 18 year old boy who doesn't know what he's doing. And um, so right then and there, I'm like, I'm going to go to SAT because I've never been challenged like this before. Um, nobody from UIW or in Carnegie, look, there goes my light that was going to go out. Um, nobody from these other schools that I was thinking about going, you know, came up to me. No, none of them ever created a program that was welcoming like that. So I was like, I'm going to go to SAC. And once again, I covered sports and I like to tell this story too. I'll never forget. Um, I think it was my second year at SAC during the Ranger. And I remember, um, my beat was SGA. I never knew my beat was SGA because all I covered was basketball games. I would cover the men's and women's games the same night, have them done by the following morning, both, both stories. And I'll never forget, Aubrey goes like, oh, there's a big SGA meeting. Um, who's covering SGA? Me being the, the, the class clown that I am, I was like, yeah, whose beat is SGA? And then she looks, hey, that's your beat. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so um, that kind of disciplined me. You know, like, hey, like, this is your beat. Follow it. Obviously, you can cover other stories that you want to do but, you know, follow this beat. So, um, yeah, from there, I go to AM San Antonio. Um, I interned at a couple places, La Prensa, back when it was an actual newspaper. Um, interned with Follow Media, which was um, ran by H-E-B Butt Family Foundation. Ben Olivo was one of the editors over there. Now he's at he's running the San Antonio Hair Run. Interned with Spectrum. So I always tell the story of how I got this job at Spectrum. I got the job because of Trisha. And I always credit her because uh, I don't know if y'all have ever heard of the San Antonio Association Hispanic Journalist Scholarship. Have y'all? Raise your hand. Yeah, nod ahead. Cool. No? Um, well, I'm a recipient of that scholarship, 2016. Now I'm a board member. Uh, it's my second year serving as a board member. And I got the scholarship. I was leaving SEC to go to AM San Antonio. And I went to an after party and the director of Spectrum News was there. I didn't even know what Spectrum News was at the time because that's when they were shifting from Time Warner to Spectrum. So I meet the guy, Michael Pearsons, and he had this country accent, which I don't understand. I heard he's from Connecticut. We need to talk about that later. But <laughs> I'll never forget. He, he's like, hey, Jose, I heard you're a fantastic sports reporter. You know, Trish has told me all about you. She's great things about you. And I was like, wait, Trisha said that? The same Trisha that I argue with every day about little things, that, you know? And he's like, yeah, she, 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 she vouched for and she, she vouched for you. And I was like, oh, wow. I, I guess, you know, I guess she liked that. I kind of like, I, I, not that I was challenging her, but it was more so trying to like one up her, but it was like me, like believing in something and me like being passionate about something. I think that's what she saw. I don't know. I've never really asked her about that, but anyways, I get an internship on the spot, um, intern with Spectrum. I cover the Spurs for a whole year. It was the year Kawhi got hurt. Um, and you know, <laughs> rest is history, but um didn't want to do tv still like i was like this is cool but i don't want to be in front of a camera i know i'm pretty and all i'm joking i'm not and i, I never thought i could be in front of a camera i had the personality for it but i just like i gotta put makeup on i gotta go live i gotta do this fake voice i don't want to do that 
continued the writing journey after I graduated from A&M San Antonio. Um, I wrote um, high school sports stories for the Express News and I double dipped because Vincent Davis, who's been my mentor since I was in high school, he got me in the door on the Metro side, which is like community based stuff. You know, the it's like if you have a story in Metro, you know, it's, it's a, you know, you're going to be more than likely on the front page. And um, so I was double dipping, getting the best of both worlds. 2019 in October, I get a call from Spectrum and they're like, hey, like we're looking for a full time reporter, San Antonio person who can tell compelling stories. You check all these boxes, you're interested, apply. I'm like, hell yeah, let's do it. And it's been the perfect marriage because what we do at Spectrum is we tell issue based stories. Well, so we don't they don't send reporters to, you know, fires, oil leaks, gas leaks, shootings that, you know, that aren't it's news, but it's not like enough to send a reporter. It's like, all right, we can send a photographer. They get some video that, you know, they can write something for the anchor and that's it, you know? So for me, I get to hang out with people in the community, which is fun. Like when I did the story on um, journalism, you know, um, being a student journalist for me, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't a student journalist in the pandemic. I don't know what it's like. I want to know what it's like. So I hung out with Rocky. We literally went to a coffee shop. We're cruising in his, you know, in his car, you know, we went to the West side, he was taking photos. It was cool. It was a very intimate story. It felt like you were there with him. And I get to do that kind of stuff now at Spectrum. But yeah, I like to cover a lot of stories in the area that I grew up in. So I hope that was probably the quickest way I've wrapped up, you know, everything that, wow, I'm so proud of myself for that. <laughs> Usually I take a year and a day to explain my journey because it is very complex. It's not uh, a normal journey. None of our journeys are, but mine is, you know, it's all over the place. Um, but yeah, that's, um, someone asked me questions because I get nervous in these things. I, I get in front of a camera every day, but talking in front of you guys, like it, it scares me. Like it's terrifying. <laughs> so somebody ask me something, please. Uh, how, how have you managed um, working during the pandemic? Like what? difference did it really hit you like doing interviews going from interviewing in person and going online um it was crazy like I kid you not maybe throughout the pandemic I only had like two zoom heavy stories which is crazy like um like I took precaution like crazy I had wipes I would wipe I would wipe the mics down the day before the day of I'm like and I'll wipe it in front of them to let them know uh, but it's crazy, you know, unfortunately, there are people who are like, oh, it's fine. I'm like, what do you mean? It's, it's not fine, bro. We're, we're in a pandemic. Um, so I was fortunate enough to interview folks who were comfortable. And I would have a stand at times and we would social distance. Um, I would get creative with it. I would, I would literally do a, a video like on my iPhone, a tutorial like, hey, these are the kind of shots that I do with my phone. If you can do that, have a family member do it for you. Send it to me. Perfect. And so I, you have to get creative with it at times because I don't know how many times I saw on the news is the the reporter on the story doing this in front of their computer. And then they do the, they'll do like the USB jack, you know, like a close up of that. And then like, they'll do like an over the shoulder of the screen thinking like, oh my gosh, this is so creative. It really wasn't. It was very like, it was, everyone was using that formula. So for me, like, I like, I don't like to be like, I'm say I'm going to be different, but I want people to be engaged because we're not like we're like even like at the beginning of the pandemic, like how many of us enjoyed these these Zoom calls? Like we hated it. Like they're terrible. They're boring. Like like I like to be around people. Like you know that's like that's how I get like energy. I I built like I uh, feed off of people. And uh, so like imagine you being a viewer. Like you you Zoom for school. You Zoom for work. You Zoom for everything. And then you see a news story and it's Zoom. It's like mm, click whatever. So I was fortunate enough. And then at, around that time, you know, um, you know, the George Floyd's, the murder of George Floyd, you know, we could say murder now um, because, you know, it's it's official. You know, um, Chauvin was hit with those, you know, those three those three um, counts. Um, there's a lot of people protesting, a lot of people in the streets, a lot of people that, you know, you could you can like grab in person and interview and talk to and like, hey, like, can I follow up with you? Um, so there was a lot of that. Um, so yeah, it's crazy. Like, like, I feel like for print reporters, you know, it's, it's whatever you could do it over the phone. 
But for me, I have to get that video. I have to make it interesting. Otherwise, you're not going to care. And if you don't care, you don't get the audience to care, then, you know, like, it doesn't matter, like, what great thing the person says in your story. It doesn't matter how you, you know, you report it. Like, if you don't get the message across, then you kind of failed your mission as a reporter. Um, how long have I been at Spectrum? Um, I've been at Spectrum since December 2019. So I'm a journalist. And the reason why I'm a journalist is because I suck at math. So what is that, a year and eight months, maybe? Yeah, a year and eight. No, not even. Oh, no, a year and 10 months. I don't know. Uh, I, I, somebody save me. Um, uh, have you done a story on the hesitancy of Hispanics to be vaccinated or anything about the pandemic? Yes, I have, actually. I did that story shoot back in may it was funny i i did that hesitancy story um when i was getting my second vaccine vaccination um so the intro to my story and i had the pr person from ut health i was like hey like i'm doing this story it really has nothing to do with you guys but i'm getting my shot through y'all is it cool if i can get footage of me getting the shot and they're like yeah let's do it so the nurse was like very lively she was a sweet woman and got some cool shots and you know got the shot but um, so what Edgewood ISD was doing is um, they were doing these workshops with doctors who were schooling them on the vaccine, what's in it. This is how you reverberate the information to the community so that way they can understand. Um, so I followed these three women that were going to the, the barrio, talking to the gente, informing them about the vaccine, telling them, hey, you know, it's, it's OK. Like, you know, there's no chip. You know, you're not going to turn into a zombie kind of thing. And it was cool, but it, it was crazy, like the, the amount of hesitancy that there was for, for a lot of people, uh, especially people of color, you know, black and brown people. Um, like when we go to doctors, we're, like we don't see doctors that look like, well, we'll see a nurse, we'll see someone at the desk that looks like us, but it's, it's very rare we'll see a doctor that looks like us that can understand where we're coming from. Um, so yeah, the, that, um, I definitely did that story. Um, I also did a story on the black community uh, on hesitancy amongst them. Um, got a lot of cool people who were who understood both sides and it was really cool to have those conversations with people I have a question um, I'm really interested in cover like social problems and everything and you say that you cover stories from economically disadvantaged this has been sorry this is ah, wait disadvantage disadvantage areas um, how do you approach the people to tell the stories? Because sometimes it's like a sad moment or something terrible happened. How have you approach to that person to tell the story? Two things. You have a cool accent. And secondly, oh, no. great question. That was a great question. Um, I think for me, um, and I think I get it from my mother. Um, like you could, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to say I have these magical powers, but I can somehow feel what someone's feeling and like they don't have to necessarily express it in their face. They can do it in body language. And I adapt immediately. You know, I adapt to, um, to like a more like empathetic person. Like I turn into a person, like I try and make myself and I'm going to answer your question. It seems like I'm not answering, but um, like for me, when I approach a story, I want people to feel comfortable. I don't want them to feel like, Oh, this reporter is talking to me. And like, this is like, him talking to me and not necessarily us having a conversation. I want it to be a conversation. I want to make them laugh. So usually what I'll do beforehand, I'll be like, hey, you know, um, just tell me your first and last name and uh, give me your social security number and tell me the last novella you saw. And like, they'll laugh or like, they'll like let off a little, like a little, ha. Huh. They're like, oh, this guy's cool. Like, and then they'll like immediately, like, like their nerves, they don't go away completely, but they're a little bit more calmer. And you get a much better answer from them. And um, so when it comes to situations where like they're really sad or they're crying, I just, I mean, you know, I let them know, like, hey, like, take your time, let it out. You know, it's, it's okay. And if they don't feel comfortable with me rolling still, I'm like, you know, I can stop if you need me to. Um, I usually don't say that, you know, if I can see it in their face, like if they're like, oh, no, like they'll walk away or whatever. Um, but it, I mean, it depends on the situation. It depends on the person. There's just some people who, um, and it was funny, we actually talked about this the other day. Um, we had like a big work meeting in Austin. And, we, you know, there someone was talking about how one of the, my coworkers in Dallas said that he had a situation when they asked him if he can not, if they cannot show that emotion. And I was like, wow, I've never had anyone tell me that before. Um, 
but I was glad with his answer that, you know, he respected their wishes. It's like, you know, this is what they're comfortable with. They're not comfortable with. These are their stories. There's one thing I'm Vincent Davis probably told you this already. He's like, respect the people that you do stories on. You know, if they say, if it's off the record, it's off the record. You know, if they, you know, if they say like, Hey, I, I don't, I don't know about that. Just leave it out. You know, there's no need to, um, if, if you get that deep into a story where someone's sharing something like that with you, they've given you enough great information you know, building up to that already. So you don't need that. Vince calls it the extra fat on your food. Like you can trim it. You don't, you don't need that extra fat. You don't need all that stuff in there. Um, so for me, it's just play it by ear. Um, um, everyone's different. Like I said, like for me, I can know when someone's feeling uncomfortable and when they're not. And I, I'll immediately shift gears. Like I interviewed this mother, for instance, there's a barbecue spot on the East side. It's called Skinny Blacks. It's named after Marquise Jones, who was killed by SAPD in 2014. And they opened the barbecue spot, named it after him. And the mother was bawling the whole interview. And I was looking around. I was like, okay. Not, not looking around when she was crying, but keeping eye contact with her. And I'm like, okay. Oh, there's a framed jersey up there. It was Paul Pierce. I'm like, let's tap into our sports knowledge. Hey, you know, was Marquise a Paul Pierce fan? She's like, oh, he loved Paul Pierce. I was like, oh, you told me he played ball. Like, who did he emulate on the court? She's like, oh, my gosh. And she starts laughing. She's like, they used to call him little Dwayne Wade, you know, and they immediately like laughter builds, like the, the, the conversation is going in a, in a way where it's still very sad, but she's happy at the same time. And she talked about how he graduated early from high school, which nobody really told that part of his story. And I, I automatically humanized him. I made her comfortable and I was able to get, get great information in the story. So I feel like, I hope I answered your question. I said a lot to you, but um, it just depends. Um, but you're gonna figure it out the more with the more you interview, the more people you interact with. Just in general, like have conversations with people, you know. I feel like that's great exercise. Um, but yeah. Wow. Silence. Hey. I was can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I was just wondering, did you go to um, SAC for freshman and sophomore? Yeah, so I went, I went for five semesters. No, not five. Probably six. I don't even remember, honestly. Um, so when I applied for SAC, I did everything by myself. Um, at that time, you could use your tax scores, your tax test scores. <laughs> um, you could use your tax scores to determine if you need remedial math or you don't need it. I didn't know that until a year later. So I, I like rushed through the Accuplacer test and I had remedial math, remedial writing, uh, remedial reading. And I got a hundred and all those. And it was, I was like, I didn't need these classes. And my counselor told me, she was like, Hey, you didn't need to take all these classes. Like your scores were good. I was like, well, give me and tell me that when I was applying. So literally um, I couldn't do the Ranger until my sophomore year. So literally I missed out a whole year of the Ranger newspaper, which was very discouraging because a year of not um, doing what you, you know, working towards something that you want to do for your career was, um, it was discouraging. It, it's kind of derailing at, at the same time. But, you know, once I started, I hit the ground running. And I was like, all right, cool. Like, you know, I'm just going to write as many stories as I can um, and learn as much as I can, you know, especially making up for the missed time that I, that I did. But yeah, I was there up until spring 2016. That was my last semester. And that's when I took Dr. Lowe's um, video two class or photo two class, which is strictly video. Um, that was a lot of fun. So that helped me a lot. That benefited me a lot now that I'm a TV reporter, because I remembered him, you know, doing those cutaway shots. I remember him, you know, teaching us about B-roll and making it an entertaining story. <laughs> Y'all got no questions. Y'all woke me up this early in the morning. Y'all got no questions. Really? Really? Check I'm joking. The They're in there. The There's chat. two in the chat. <laughs> There's two in the chat? What? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm like focused on like making eye contact with you guys. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'll get y'all Barbara Koa this weekend. Um, are you bilingual and how does it affect your effectiveness? Oh, yes, I'm bilingual. Um, it was actually my first language. And then they took me out of ESL when I was in first grade. I mean, I knew both really well, but I kind of lost my tongue for, 
for years. Like I didn't start talking in Spanish until college. Um, like if you ever work retail or, or like any, anything in the service industry, you're going to have the gente who don't know English that well. And you're going to have coworkers who are very ignorant, you know, you know, like, like in the retail world, I had this one coworker, he wasn't even trying to meet um, this, this gentleman who's Mexicano who didn't know English that well. He was trying to meet him halfway. And it's like, bro, if you meet him halfway, it's going to pay off. So that's where I started to practice is, you know, working at Ross, working at Gap, working at the Alamo Draft House as a server, just like flexing when I go to a Mexican restaurant, ordering in Spanish. Um, so I got my tongue back talking to my dad, who's from Mexico, because um, I understood it really well. It's just speaking it. Um, so the more I spoke it, the better I got. And it actually paid off when I went to go cover um, the, the Haitian migrants coming through Del Rio. Um, a lot of the Haitians know Spanish really well. So literally having these intimate conversations with them, sitting down with them, spending time with them, learning about them was really, really fascinating. And then interviewing the gente from Acuña, Mexico, uh, interviewing the people from Del Rio who were affected by this because the border was closed. Um, it's definitely paid off um, like, like wonders because I have some coworkers, like sometimes I'll, I'll be with my, my coworker who's a photographer and he's like, he's like, I'm sorry, I don't know Spanish. And I'm like, I'm like, bro, how are you from the South side? And I know Spanish. <laughs> so I'll be that translator for them. Um, and I like, I like to make our gente feel comfortable because I know how difficult it is to learn English because the English is like, it's so regional. You know, some words don't mean the same thing as they mean somewhere else. And I know that could be very confusing for, for anyone who's, who's an immigrant trying to learn English. Um, so it's definitely paid off really well in, in work, just in life in general too. Um, what are some things you took away from the ranger that you still use now or early in your career? Um, I think just getting straight to the point um, in a story. I feel like everyone, like everyone has this habit, right? especially when I read cover letters for friends who are trying to, they go through like, when I was a baby, when I was in middle school, when I was this, and it's just like, I don't care about, like I do, but what's happening now? Like what's like, like, I care about you right now. Like, let me know, like, what's going on right now. You know, and if, like, same thing with, with, with the Haitian migrants. It's like, don't talk about, like, something that's not relevant to right now. You know, immediately get to the point to where it's like, hey, like, this is happening right now. You know, this is so-and-so. They're one of, you know, tens of thousands of migrants who, whatever. You know, you know make it, make me care immediately because I, I like to assume that no one cares. No one's going to care and you got to make them care. Um, whether it's a reader, whether it's someone scrolling past social media, you, you have to do it in a way where um, you get them engaged, um, paint a picture. Vince does a great job of doing this when in his writing. And I like to do it in my T group. I like to get that opening shot that's going to get your attention. I did a story on a bookstore, the first Latino bookstore, um, or first Latino books are on the West Side in a very long time, or just bookstore in general. And I had this guy, he's this Mexicano from Houston, who he's the curator. He drives down every week. And this guy was walking around the West Side with books saying, banned books, get your banned books. And he looked like a crazy man. And you watching that story, you're like, I want to know who this guy is. And I did this wide shot of him, like on the other side by the cultural arts center. He's just holding this book and he looks like he's like, yeah, read this. Like, and I was, and I essentially said, you know, he's preaching the Latino book gospel to the West Side. And it was just very funny. You're like, what? And it, get, it immediately gets you hooked. And that's one thing that I learned from the Rangers, you know, that inverted pyramid. Um, you know, sometimes in TV, it doesn't work that way because sometimes there's a reveal in story. So you kind of build up to it. But that's definitely something. Um, just getting information, all the information that you, you can. I'll never forget. I had interviewed. Um, uh, what is her name? D. What's her name, Trisha? D. Dixon. Uh, D. Yeah. Dixon. I'll never forget. I went to go interview D. Dixon. Right. And this, this is after the whole SGA thing. And I'll never forget. I went up to her and this woman like ripped me to shreds. And I'm like, I'm supposed to be interviewing you. And you're like critiquing me doing my job. She's like, where's your reporter's book at? <sighs> Put out the drawer. She's like, here you go. All right. Now you can ask me some questions. And it was just so funny. Like she checked me and I needed that. Like I just, I had this big, head. I still have a big head guys, but like literally I have a big head. Um, but you know, um, just her telling me that, you know, she was a ranger kid and she, she's like, hey, like, don't forget the, you know, the fundamentals because it's going to benefit you. I, I come across TV reporters like I, you know, I said off the record earlier, we're not going to talk about it, you know, now that things are being recorded. But you see other TV reporters and like 
they're not being taught how to report, you know, in school. They're just being taught how to perform in front of a camera, do quote unquote creative shots, fancy shots, whatever. That's about it. And luckily for me, I have that foundation. I have that Ranger Foundation, you know, that Express News Foundation, that writing foundation that can help me paint a picture for people. Um, the editor gives you stories to cover or you also search for some topics, events that you want to cover. So for me, um, I pitch like 99.9% .9 of my stories I do or something that I pitch. Um, as you guys get better, I don't know if you guys want to be reporters, but um, the longer you're in this, the bigger your Rolodex gets. And a Rolodex is a thing where you have like business cards. If you guys don't know what that is, you know, some of you young folks. Um, and you, you just build that, that, that contact list. Like the other day I was like looking through my contacts, like, dang, I have a lot of contacts. And most of these are not even people that I like, I know that well, they're just people that I built relationship with, you know, through, through my work. And um, literally they're blowing up my phone with stories all the time, social media. So for me, I think those are the best kind of stories is the ones that you pitch. Cause you're, one, you're going to be passionate about it. And two, like, it's something that's going to be very pressing because more than likely you're going to be like, oh, I think this is a story and you pitch it and, and it, it builds that um, those muscles of pitching. Cause I feel like a lot of people are hesitant when they pitch. Like me, when I pitch a story, I'm confident. I'm like, Hey, this, that, and that, like our boss always tells us two, three sentences. Tell me what your story is. And then go to the next one, you know? <laughs> and <clears throat> um, so that, that's how it is for me. Um, especially being born and raised in San Antonio, like I'm never going to run out of stories, never. And if I do, then I'm doing a bad job, but literally is, I, I have to like schedule stories like two weeks. Like I want to do a story on the Ranger, you know, the Ranger shutting down is very sad. It's disheartening. Breaks my heart. I can't do it this week. Cause I'm booked. I can't do it next week. Cause I'm booked with stories. I, I'm like, it's not that it's, this is not an important story, but it's like, there's other stories that I've already scheduled. And being a TV reporter, you can't just like be like, all right, like let's meet another day where we can go in front of a camera because then I, that might not fit that person's schedule. You know, for print reporters, it's easy. You could just call people like, hey, 10 minutes of your time. That's it. For me, it's like I got to meet with them. So it's like an hour kind of thing. Um, but yeah. Um, I, just for, oh, sorry. Uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Now, I was going to say, like, aside from, like, some of the serious stuff, do you usually try to build rapport when meeting with some of the people, especially, like, over on the West side? Um, we say, say that one more time. I'm sorry, bro. Like, aside from, like, the more serious stuff, mm -hmm. like, stuff going on the border, like, with the Haitians and stuff, um, if it's more stuff, like, on the West side or, you know, you covering a story, do you usually try to build rapport with the people you meet, or is it always kind of, like, get to the point? No, I always build rapport. So um, one thing I like to do is um, try and visit them beforehand. Like, on, on, you know, maybe I'm done with my work day and, you know, I'm like, hey, like, you know, hang out with him for 20, 30 minutes, chat with him, kind of like, hey, like, you know, let's meet on this day or going to an event, you know, not expecting, like, I don't expect stories when I go to an event. I don't expect stories when I meet people. I just want to meet people. And I feel like that comes off really well with them because they're like, oh, they're not just using me for a story. Because a lot of these, a lot of these um, reporters, quote unquote reporters, you know, in this industry will do that. They just show up, get whatever they need and they dip. And, you know, and to me, that's very disrespectful. Like, like I said, you know, the, the, the community has the right to not allow us to tell their story. It's their story. It's not my story. I never say this is my story. I always say this is a story that I did. That's what I always say. And um, so they play a big role in it, you know, because they're the ones who trust us. They're the ones who allow us into their lives. So I feel like the least we can do is spend some time with them. The least we can do is check on them every now and then, whether it's through text or give them a call. Like, hey, what's going on? You know, um, all right, cool, man. And, uh, you know, and they'll ask how I'm doing and you build that relationship, you know, it's, and we're not, it's not like we're going to get a drink or we're going to get coffee every day, but it's like, you let them know, like, Hey, like, I'm still thinking about you. Hey, like, I still appreciate you trusting me with your story kind of thing. And um, it comes off really well. And it's, it's, I mean, it's best to do that practice in general as human beings. I feel like most people don't, don't, don't even know their neighbor's kid or they don't even know their neighbor's name. Like, you know, growing up, you know, you, if you got in trouble, your neighbor three streets over is going to tell your mom, like, by the time you get home, like, your mom already knows what you did, you know? 
And I feel like that's kind of being lost, you know, especially now where everyone's just kind of like in their own little world. Um, but it's definitely benefited me um, in my storytelling because, dude, like you put a relationship with somebody, they'll vouch for you like to people that don't even like I've I've interviewed people who hate the media. Like who are like, no, like, you know, one time they did a story and they got it wrong. And and literally, though, they'll, they'll be like, hey, like, no, Jose's from the West Side. He's someone who's in the community like I can vouch for him. It's crazy. Like, it's just crazy. Like to think same way Trisha vouched for me to the director of Spectrum News is now the community is doing that for me. And I think it, it, it also falls back on the quality of stories. You do a crappy story or you do like a story that's, you know, kind of half assed or like you didn't put too much work into it. It's going to reflect and people are going to be like, wow, like this person didn't really care. They're just trying to, you know, get a story count. I feel like that's what a lot of people do. Like, you know, for us, we have to hit our story count. For me, it's like, I don't need a story count. Like I already, I have plenty of stories. I don't need to hit a quota. Like I'm going to get them their quota. But at the end of the day, I want a great story. And if I have to push that date back later, my, my deadline, my bosses are going to understand that too. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I, I definitely build a great relationship with the community. You have to, you have to in this industry. Cause if you don't like, you can't just like, like, I know a lot of us, we, we get stories off of Twitter or we'll DM somebody or email somebody, but, but it, it's, it's different when you knock on someone's door It's different when you go to their business It's different when you go to their house, like that's when they know, like, man, this person gives a shit about my story. Okay, so you just for curiosity, you talk about your schedule. So how that works for you? Like you just work, you go to reporting something and you go to the studio and you edit it and that's it. Or you have like a schedule you need to be to the office hour to an hour. So it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, so we were working from home before it was cool. Like when I got hired in December, 2019, they're like, you guys don't need to be here at the station. Like, as long as you get your stories in, we don't care if you're, you know, you're editing, you know, <laughs> on a rooftop, you know, we don't care. Like, get your stories in. And it's funny, I had, I just did a story on Michael Quintanilla. Uh, if you don't, guys don't know him, incredible reporter, incredible man. But, um, you know, he, we were talking about this, you know, we had a long conversation. It's like, the stories aren't in the studio. They're not in the newsroom. It's not by the printing press. The stories are in the community. So why the hell, like, do people have to be inside of, of, a, of a workplace? You know, it's, it, I just never understood that in journalism specifically. Um, so for us, you know, we have the freedom to work wherever. Um, and like, for me, I always, I always work ahead. So today, Friday, I'm going to shoot a story. <laughs> it's for next week. Tomorrow, I'm going to a protest for a story for next week. And by the time my week starts, no, but I'm already like, like, I only have one more story to do, and that's it. Um, but for me, like, there's some days where it's slow. There's some days where I wake up, you know, I reach out to my sources, set things up, and it's kind of it, you know? And I'm kind of like, all right, well, we have a whole day. Let's, let's get some more stories for two weeks from now. Um, and then there's days where, like, I think it was Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. I had three shoots for three different stories, just back to back to back to back. Um, and that was that was draining and you have those days too um so it's different for us um at spectrum like we're we're more let's let's take time with our stories let's um build great stories let's um build a great relationship with the community um, but i've been doing that since you know the ranger days um but yeah so but for me my days could be chaotic and some days it could be relaxing and some days like like I always tell people, like, I don't have a normal work schedule. Like I can literally, someone can be like, Hey, I can only meet with you at 7. AM shoot. My work day starts at 6. AM then, you know, or I can only meet you at 8. PM. All right, cool. Then I'm going to work, you know, until nine, something that day. Yeah. It just depends. Um, and I feel like that's with any journalist though. Like the, the I feel like the, the community dictates our schedule. Let's not tell them that though, because I don't like interviewing at night because the lighting's not that good <laughs> at night. <laughs> um, what's your favorite part about your job? Um, my favorite part about my job is I get to be myself. Um, I get to spend time in the community. Um, that more than anything, because I feel like if I'm at another station, there's like, hey, go to this, slap some B-roll, get some sound bites and turn it in, you know, and that's not fulfilling. 
that's not like I would be miserable if I had to do that. I would be literally miserable. And I and that was the reason why I didn't want to do TV to begin with. But when Spectrum said, hey, we're doing these longer form stories, we're doing these intimate stories, these community based stories, they want me over. And I always like, I, like I said earlier, it's the perfect marriage. Uh, that's my favorite part, though. But I really love that my bosses let me be me. Like, you'll, you'll see some reporters that are Latino and Latina, and they'll kind of whitewash their name. They'll, you know, instead of Jose Arredondo, it's I'm Joe Arredondo here on the city's west side at the Alazan Apache courts, you know, and I'm like, hell no, like I'm, I'm Jose Arredondo, you know, here in the 78207, one of the most economically disadvantaged zip codes, and they neighbor the Alazan Apache courts, you know, we're built in the 40s for poor Mexican, you know, like, be yourself and it connects with the people better, you know, but I have seen people who try to do what I do that are not Mexicano, that are not from San Antonio. And it, it's, it's just like, it's tone deaf. And so I always tell people, just be you, like be you. Like, why wouldn't you want to connect with people by being yourself? You know, like, I don't, I don't want to do this. And my boss tells me, she's like, if anyone tries to take your voice away from you, let me know. And this is the woman that, runs all of the texas stations like she she loves that i'm me i'm this little kid from the west side the little brown kid from the west side but that's my favorite part just being me and hanging out with people that's that's how i view my job silence otra vez <laughs> this makes me nervous guys don't do that like at least sing a song or something and you can like really what you're saying What's up? I said they're processing what you're saying. Oh, okay. Damn. It wasn't that deep, guys. <laughs> Bars. But I'm not a rapper. Um, you want to guys want to kill time by um me showing y'all a story or something? <laughs> 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 what are my long-term ambitions? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you're going places, kid. <laughs> <laughs> straight to retirement yeah you earned it um now miss abrigo asked me what my long-term ambitions are and um i think for me is to take this to the next level um i'm getting like national like attention from people like it's not just like spectrum like if you have a great story they'll share it to the national stations but like reporters from other like like i'm putting my work on the map and i'm not saying my work in the sense that myself but the stuff that i'm covering so people from la are learning about the west side of san antonio people from new york people from florida and that's and that's cool that's great that's like that's what i want to do i want people i always tell people like when i do a story like obviously i do it for the gente but the gente already know that story this isn't new information this isn't breaking news and they already know about this this is for people who live on the other side of town who have this stigma who have this view of our people. I want them to be educated. I want them to be like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Wow, like that changed my whole perspective. And I get it, I get a lot of that, you know, and Vince, I think Vince says it best, you know, this is the Vince Davis um, Zoom chat now because that, that man has taught me so much. He's like, we're the bridge, you know, we serve as a bridge. Like we're that bridge that connects, you know, the people that we're doing stories on and the people that need to know about this. And, um, yeah, it's, I, I love Vince. And one thing I want you guys to understand, too, I always tell um, students this um, and reporters is I don't like it when people say I'm giving a voice to the voiceless. No, you're not. You're not. <laughs> we are a platform. People already have a voice. All we are is this megaphone that, you know, we're just, you know, we're that megaphone that amplifies your voice. Like, I don't want you guys to ever say that because I, I just think that's just I don't know. I, I, I just don't like that. And it just comes off the wrong way to people. Because we're not giving a voice. They have their own voice. They just need that little platform to get their story out. Um, like giving the people a voice through you. What do you mean by that? Gabby? Or Veronica? <laughs> I think she disappeared. <laughs> Man, Veronica is on the Express News in every slide. And she's just like big time now. She's too. I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, uh, I don't know what she understand, uh, means by that question, but um, but yeah, but my long-term ambition is just to take it to the next level, take it to the next level. And at some point in a perfect world, you know, when my girlfriend's an attorney and I, you know, and she, we're rich and stuff, 
I just want to like give um, younger reporters or like just create create a platform where we could have like all these voices. Um, but that's when I'm a viejito. Like right now, I just want to take where I'm at to the next level. Um, you're making their voice be heard. Is that what you mean? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Eight minutes left. Oh my gosh, guys. What are we going to do for eight minutes? Uh -oh. um, so what would you say are some vo uh, challenges that you face in this field? Um... I think for me is because I care so much is um, and I've been doing a good job of this is not working on my days off. I used to work on my days off a lot last year. My bosses would get mad, They're like take your vacation, take your like take care of yourself. But for me, I care so much about what I do. I feel like I'm letting my my city down. I feel like I'm letting, you know, like when like like when I was in New York, I was I got stuck over there because of snowstorm. So I wasn't able here to cover anything. But more importantly, I live near a hospital. So I knew I was going to have energy and hot water. And I could have helped people. And that still bugs me to this day. You know, that was like seven months ago or eight months ago. And I, well, I wasn't there to, to help my community out. And um, I, I battle with that. And also, as surprising as it is, I get scared to, um, to approach people. I get, I, I get nervous. I just feel like I'm a burden to people. And I, <laughs> I said this to the UT kids last week. And I was like, I need to talk to my therapist about that. I just, I, I guess I, I just grew up a certain way where I feel like, um, and that's why I rely on the people that I, that, that vouch for me because I get scared to call that person, you know, who has a really great story and it's, it's, it's hard hitting. And, and I think it'll be a beautiful story. I get nervous, like calling them or, or approaching them, you know, trying to tell them like, Hey, I think it would be, you know, I think your story is very compelling. I think it could impact a lot of people. I get nervous. So that's one thing that I battle with, but it's something that's not even like my job. It's more so myself. As surprising as that is, I know you guys are like, he's lying. No, I'm not. Like, I, I get really nervous um, to approach people. Um, like whenever Trisha and Irene would be like, hey, um, you know, shadow reporter, you know, for a project, I would get scared. I would like pretend to email a reporter and not really email them. Be like, oh, they didn't get back to me, you know, um, and Vince will find somebody for me. Um, but it's cool, like the younger generation, like they don't care, like they'll, they'll blow up my phone. And that's cool. And I'm glad I'm glad they have confidence. They have the confidence that I didn't have, that I'm still kind of battling with, like, they're not afraid to reach out to a, a, a professional and ask them, you know, to shadow them or ask them for advice. I think that's really cool. And that's one thing I want you guys to do, like, don't feel like you can't um, bug me. Don't view it as bugging me. I say bug because I bug people. But um, like, literally, if you need help, you need advice. I can either I can help you or I can find someone that can help you because I'm not gonna like give you like bad information. Like for the for the like for the women, like for for Latinas, like I know the struggle as a Latino being in this industry, but I don't know the struggle of being a woman, let alone a woman of color in this industry. So I'll never be like, oh, this worked for me, so it's gonna work for you. So what I'm gonna do is find, you know, a badass Latina, because there's a lot of them out there in this field that can help y'all out and you know, help you navigate, you know, through you know these obstacles. Um, but yeah, um, I don't know well, how many minutes are left. Five, four, five, and five. we have Carolina in two weeks. Carolina, Carolina Vera. Oh man, yeah, I, I can't, I can't compete with that, guys. <laughs> wow. Um, anything else you guys want to know? Bye, Mandy. Can oh, she already left. Your socials and my contact information. Yeah, so my social, I'll put in the chat. Sports guy Jose, very simple. It's both Instagram and um, IG and Twitter. And then my number is 281-330-8004. No, I'm just kidding. That's Mike Jones. Um, but my number, I'm going to put it right now. Because I don't want the, when you post this, no, the chat will not go with the video. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. They can have my number two shoot. Like, might be some sources watching this story. Um, You're verified on Instagram? Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an influencer. I'm just kidding. Period. Let's go. <laughs> and like everyone's congratulating me. Like if I just got a raise or something, I'm like, bro, like that check mark doesn't mean anything to me if, you know, <laughs> uh, he's famous. Chill, Rocky, you're more famous than me. 
but Can I um follow you you're mr famous have a very i am not famous no, i am i'm literally no better than anybody um but um so like i said earlier i'm gonna do a story so if any of you guys you know would like to be in the story you know whether it's through your voice or just be you know uh, an extra you know in the newsroom like the more the merrier but uh, wear your mask <laughs> Nah, uh, but I, I really want to capture this story because I feel like, um, not that the other places that covered it failed to do it, but I feel like I had that insight that they don't have. I know what it's like to be a part of the Ranger. I know the impact that it's had on a lot of people. So, um, you know, in a couple weeks, two weeks from now, like I'm going to do that story and I want you guys to be a part of it because uh, this is history, man. You know, literally the best publication in the city is like, you know, shutting down the be best college publication because the best is spectrum because i'm there i'm kidding <laughs> but yeah like honestly like the ranger like literally we compete against universities kick their ass and we're just little community college kids like can you believe that and like we're telling better stories than them that's that's incredible <laughs>